Hello everyone and welcome to 100 Stories Deep. My name is Aaron Gill and today I'm going to be reading The Centaur by Jose Saramago taken from his book The Life of Things uh, and the reason why I've chosen this story is because I think it's a really really beautiful allegory um, into so many different things about displacement, about uh, moving from one land to another um, and of about being acknowledged by others to say from others to you that you exist. Uh, so yeah, I think it's a really, really beautiful story. Uh, it's warning, it's quite sad as well and it's very descriptive. But, but yeah, I hope you enjoy it. And this is The Centaur by Jose Saramago. The horse came to a halt. His shoeless hooves gripped the round, slippery stones covering the riverbed, which was almost dry. Using his hands, the man cautiously pushed back the thorny branches which obstructed his view of the plain. Day was breaking. Far away where the land rose, first in a gentle slope, for he remembered it being similar to the pass he had descended far north before suddenly being woken up by a ballistic mountain ridge rising up in a vertical wall. Stood some houses which, from a distance, looked quite small and low, and lights that resembled stars. Along the mountain ridge which cut out the entire horizon from that side, there was a luminous line as if someone had passed a light brushstroke over the peaks, and, because still wet, the paint had gradually spread over the slope. The sun would appear from that direction. One false move as he pushed back the branches and the man grazed his hand. He muttered something to himself and put his finger to his lips to suck the blood. The horse retreated, stamping his hooves and swishing his tail over the tall grasses that absorbed the remaining moisture on the riverbank, sheltered by overhanging branches forming a screen at that black hour. The river was reduced to a trickle of water running between the stones where the riverbed was deepest at rare intervals, forming puddles wherein fish struggled to survive. The humidity in the atmosphere forecast rain and tempest, perhaps not today but tomorrow after three suns, or within the next moon. Very slowly the sky began to light up, time to find a hiding place in order to rest and to sleep. The horse was thirsty. He approached a stream which seemed still quite beneath the still night sky. And as his front hooves met the cool water, he lay down sideways on the ground, resting one shoulder on the rough sand. The man drank at his leisure, despite feeling no thirst. And above the man, the horse and the patch of sky that was still, dark, that was still in darkness slowly moved. Trailing in its wake, the palest light, still tinged with yellow, the first deceptive hint of the crimson and red about to explode over the mountains. The horse and man got up. In front stood a dense barrier of trees, with defensive brambles between the trunks. Birds were already chirping on their uppermost branches. The horse crossed the riverbed at an unsteady trot and tried to break through the entangled bushes on the right but the man preferred an easier passage. With time, and there had been all the time in the world, he had learned how to curb the animal's impatience, sometimes opposing him with an upsurge of violence which clouded his thoughts, or perhaps affected that part of his body where the orders coming from his brain clashed with the dark instincts nourished between his flanks where the skin was black, and at other times he succumbed, distracted, and thinking of other things, things that certainly belonged to this physical world in which he found himself, but not to this age. Fatigue had made the horse nervous. He quivered as if trying to shake off a frenzied thirsting for blood, as, and he stamped his hooves relentlessly, only to tire on even more. It would have been unwise to try and force an entry through the entanglement of brambles. There were so many scars on the horse's white coat. One particular scar, which was very old, traced a broad, oblique mark on his rump. When exposed to the blazing sun, or when extreme cold made the hairs of his coat stand up, it was as if the 
flaming blade of a sword was striking that sensitive and vulnerable scar. Although well aware that he would find nothing there except a bigger scar than the others, at such moments the man would twist his torso and look back as if staring into infinity. <laughs> a short distance away, downstream, the river bank narrowed. In all probability there was a lagoon, or perhaps a tributary, just as dry or even more so. It was muddy at the bottom with few stones. Around this pocket, as it were, a simple neck of the river that filled and emptied it stood tall trees, black beneath the darkness, only gradually rising from the earth. If the screen formed by trunks and fallen branches was sufficiently dense, he could pass there the day for the day, completely hidden from sight, until night returned, when he could continue on his way. He drew back the cool leaves with his hand and, impelled by the strength of his hops, he climbed into the embankment in almost total darkness, concealed by the thick crests of the trees. Then, almost immediately, the ground sloped again into a ditch which further on would probably run through open countryside. He had found a good spot to rest and sleep. Between the river and the mountain there was an arable land, tilled fields, but that deep and narrow ditch showed no signs of being passable. He took a few more steps, now in complete silence. Startled birds were watching. He looked overhead, saw the uppermost tips of the branches bathed in light. The soft light coming through the mountain was now skimming the leafy fringe on high. The birds resumed their chirping. The light descended little by little. A greenish dust changing to pink and white, the subtle and uncertain morning mist. Against the light, the pitch black trunks of the trees appeared out of only two dimensions, as if they had been cut out of whatever remained of the night and were glued to a luminous transparency that was disappearing into the ditch. The ground was covered with irises, a nice, tranquil refuge where he could spend the day sleeping. Overcome by the fatigue of centuries and millennia, the horse knelt down. Finding a position to suit both of them was always a difficult operation. The horse usually lay on his side and the man did likewise. But while the horse could spend an entire night in this position without stirring, if the man wanted to avoid getting cramp in his shoulder and all down his side, he had to overcome the resistance of that great inert and slumbering body and make him turn over on the other side. It was always a disquieting dream. As for sleeping on foot, the horse could, but not the man. And when the hideout was too confined, changing from one side to another became impossible, and the sense of urgency awed the greater. It was not an uncomfortable body. The man could never stretch out on the ground, rest his head on the fold his arms, and remain there studying the ants or grains of the earth or can contemplate the whiteness of a tender stalk sprouting from the dark soil. And in order to see the sky, he had to twist his neck, except when the horse reared upon its hind legs, lifting the man high so that he could view it a great nocturnal of the stars, the horizontal and tumultuous meadow of clouds, or the blue sunlit sky, the last vestiges of the first creation. The horse fell asleep at once, with his hooves amongst the irises and his bushy tail spread out on the ground. He lay there, breathing heavily at a steady rhythm. Semi-reclined and with his right shoulder pressed up against the wall of the ditch, the man broke off lying branches with which to cover himself. While moving, he could hear, he, whilst moving, he could bear the heat and cold without any discomfort, although not as well as the horse. But when asleep and lying still, he soon began to feel the cold. And so, as long as the heat of the sun did not become too intense, he could rest at ease under the shade of the leaves. From this position, he perceived that the trees did not entirely shut out the sky above. An uneven strip, already a transparent blue, stretched ahead and crossing it intermittently from one side to the other, or momentarily following in the same direction 
Birds were flying swiftly through the air. The man slowly closed his eyes. The smell of sap from the broken branches made him feel a little faint. He pulled one of the leafier branches over his face and fell asleep. He never dreamed like other men, nor did he ever dream as a horse might dream. During their hours of wakefulness, there was a few moments of peace or simple conciliation, but the horse's dream, along that with of the man, constituted the centaur's dream. He was the last survivor of that great and ancient species of men, horses. He had fought in the war against the Lapite, the first serious defeat suffered by him and his fellow centaurs. Once they had been defeated, the centaur had taken refuge in the mountains whose name he had forgotten. Until that fatal day when, protected in part by the gods, Heracles had decimated his brothers and he alone had escaped because the long drawn out battle between Heracles and Nessos had given him time to seek refuge in the forest. And that was the end of the centaurs. But contrary to the claims of historians and mythologists, one centaur survived. This self-same centaur who had seen Heracles crush Nephos to death with one terrible embrace and then drag his corpse along the ground as Hector would later do with the corpse of Achilles. Whilst praising the gods for having overcome and exterminated the prodigious race of the centaurs. Perhaps remorseful, those same gods then favoured the hidden centaur, blinding Heracles' eyes and mind for who knows what reason. Each day the centaurs dreamt, each day the centaur dreamt of fighting and, van and vanquishing Heracles. In the centre of the circle of gods who reunited with every dream, he would fight arm to arm, using his croup to dodge any sly move on the enemy's part, and avoid the rope whizzing between his hooves, thus forcing the enemy to fight face to face. His face, his arms and trunk perspired only as a man perspires. The horse's body was covered in sweat. This dream recurred for thousands of years and always with the same outcome. He punished Heracles for Nessos' death, summoning all the strength in his limbs and muscles as both man and as horse. Set firmly on his four hooves as if they were stakes embedded in the earth. He lifted Heracles into the air and tightened his grip until he could bear, until he could hear the first rib cracking, then another. And finally, the spine breaking, Heracles' corpse slipped into the ground like a rag and the gods applauded. There was no prize for the victor. Rising from their gilt thrones, the, the gods moved away, the circle becoming ever wider until they disappeared into the horizon. From the door where Aphrodite entered the heavens, an enormous star continued to shine. For thousands of years, he roved this earth. For ages, so long as the world itself remained mysterious, he could travel by the light of the sun. As he passed, people came out on the roadside and threw garlands of flowers over the horse's back or made cornets which they placed over his head. Mothers handed him their children to lift into midair so that they might lose any fear of heights. And everywhere there was a secret ceremony in the middle of a circle of trees representing the gods. Impotent men and sterile women passed under the horse's belly. People believed that this would promote fertility and restore vitality. Virility, sorry. At certain times of the year, they would bring a mare before the centaur and withdraw indoors. But one day, someone saw a man who, someone saw the man cover the mare like a horse, and then weep like a man who struck blind for committing such a sacrilege. These unions bore no fruit. Then the world changed. The centre was banished and persecuted and forced into hiding. And other creatures too, such as the unicorn, the chimera, the werewolf, men with cloven hooves, and those ants bigger than foxes, but smaller than dogs. For ten human generations, these various outcasts lived together in the wilderness. But after a time, even... Even there, they found life impossible and all of them dispersed. Some, like the unicorn, died. The chimera mated with the shrew mice, which led to the appearance of bats. Werewolves found their way into towns and villages, and only on certain nights do they meet their fate. 
The cloven-footed men also became extinct, and ants grew smaller in size, so that nowadays you cannot tell them apart from other insects. The centaur was now on his own. For thousands of years, as the sea would permit, he roamed the entire earth. But on his journeys, he would always make a detour whenever he sensed he was getting close to the borders of his native country. Time passed. Eventually, there was no longer any land he could live in safety. He began sleeping during the day and moving on at dusk. Walking and sleeping. Sleeping and walking for no apparent reason other than the fact that he possessed legs and needed rest. He did not need food and only he needed sleep in order to drink. And as for water, he simply drank because the water was there. Thousands of years ought to have been thousands of adventures. Thousands of adventures, however, are too many equal one truly unforgettable adventure. And that explains why all of them put together did not equal that adventure already in this last millennium, when in the midst of an arid wilderness he saw a man with lamps and a coat of armour, astride a scraggy horse, charging into an army of windmills. He saw the rider being hurled into the air, and another man, short and fat and mounted on a donkey, rushed to his assistance, shouting his head off. He then heard them speak in a language he could not understand, and then watched them go off, the thin man badly shaken, the fat one wailing, the scraggy horse limping, and the donkey impassive. He thought of going to their assistance, but on taking another look at the windmills, he galloped up to them, coming to a halt before the first windmill. He decided to avenge the man who had been thrown from his horse. In his native tongue, he cried out, Even if you had more arms than the giant Ferreris, I'll make you pay for this outrage. All the windmills were left with broken wings, and the centaur was pursued to the frontier of a neighbouring country. He crossed desolate fields and reached the sea. He then turned back. The centaur, man and beast, is fast asleep. His entire body is at rest. The dream has come and gone, and the horse is now galloping within a day from the distant past. So that, so that the man may see the mountains file past as if they were travelling with him. Or he were climbing mountain paths to the summit in order to look down the Serona Sea and the black scattered islands, the spray exploding around them as if they had just appeared from the depths and were surfacing there in wonder. This is no dream. The smell of brine comes in from the open sea. The man takes a deep breath and stretches his arms upwards while the horse excitedly stamps its hooves on protruding marble stones. Already withered, the leaves that were covering the man's face had fallen away. The sun overhead casts a speckled light on the centaur. The face is not that of an old man, nor that of a young man, needless to say, since we are talking about thousands of years. But his face could be compared with that of an ancient statue. Time had eroded it, but not to the extent of obliterating the features, simply enough to show that they are weather-beaten. A tiny, luminous patch sparkles on his skin, slowly edging towards his mouth, bringing warmth. The man suddenly opens his eyes, as a statue might. With undulating movements, a snake steals off into the undergrowth. The man raises a hand to his mouth and feels the sun. At the same time, the horse shakes its tail, sweeps it over his croup, and chases off a gadfly feeding on the delicate skin of the great scar. The horse rises quickly to its feet, accompanied by the man. The day has almost gone, and soon the first shadows of night will fall, but there can be no more sleeping. The noise of the sea, which was not a dream, still resounds in the man's ears, not the real noise of the sea, but rather that of a vision of beating waves, which his eyes transformed into these sonorous waves, which travel over the waters, climb up rocky gorges and all the way to the sun and the blue sky, which is also water. Almost there, the ditch he is following just happens to be there, and could lead anywhere. The work of men and path by, the work of men and a path by which to reach other men. But it heads in a southerly direction, and that is what matters. 
He will advance as far as possible, even in daylight, even with the sun above the entire plain, and exposing everything, whether man or beast. Once more he had defeated Heracles in his dream in the presence of all the immortal gods. But once the combat was over, Zeus retreated southwards, and only then did the mountain open up from the highest peak. Surmounted by white pillars, he looked down. He looked down on the island surrounded by spray. The frontier is nearby and Zeus headed south. Walking along the deep and narrow ditch, the man can see the countryside from one end to the other. The man now look, the lands now look abandoned. He no longer knows where the village he had seen at daybreak has disappeared to. The great rocky mountains have become taller or perhaps drawn closer. The horse's hoofs sink into the soft earth he is gradually climbing. The man's whole trunk is clearly out of the ditch. The trees space out, and suddenly, once in open countryside, the ditch comes to an end. With a simple movement, the horse makes the final descent, and the centaur appears in full daylight. The sun is to the right and shines directly onto the scar, which begins to ache and to burn. The man looks back, out of habit, and the atmosphere is stuffy and humid. Not that the sea is all that close, the humidity promises rain as does this sharp gust of wind. To the north, clouds are gathering. The man wavers. For many years he has dared not to travel out in the open and less protected by the darkness of, light, of night. But today he feels as excited as the horse. He proceeds through the scrubland where the wild flowers give off a strong scent. The plain has come to an end and the ground now rises in humps, restricting the horizon or extending it more than, than more because these elevations are already hills and a screen of mountains looms up ahead. Brushes begin to appear and the centaur begins to feel less vulnerable. He feels thirsty, very thirsty, but there is no sign of water nearby. The man looks behind and sees that one half of the sky is already covered in clouds. The sun lights up the sharp edge of an enormous grey cloud that is steadily approaching. At this moment, a dog can be heard barking. The horse trembles nervously. The centaur breaks into a gallop between the two hills, but the man does not lose his sense of direction. They must head south. The barking comes nearer. Bells can be heard ringing, and then a voice speaking to the cattle. The centaur stopped to get his bearings, but the echoes misled him, and then suddenly there is an unexpectedly humid and low-lying stretch of land. A herd of goats appears, and in front of a large dog, the centaur stops in his tracks. Several of the ugly scars on his body has been inflicted by dogs. The shepherd cried out in terror and took to his heels as if demented. He began shouting for help. There must be a village nearby. The man ordered the horse to advance. He broke a sturdy branch from a bush and in order to chase away a dog which was barking its head off in rage and terror. But fury prevailed. The dog rapidly skirted some boulders and tried to grab the centaur sideways by the belly. The man tried to look back to see where the danger was coming from but the horse reacted first and, turning quickly on its front hooves, aimed a vicious kick which caught the dog mid-air. The animal was dashed against some rocks and killed. The centaur had often been forced to defend himself in this way, but this time the man felt humiliated. He could feel the strain of all those vibrating muscles in his own body, his ebbing strength, hear the dull thud of his hooves, but he had his back to the battle, played no part in it, just a mere spectre. The sun had disappeared, the heat suddenly abated, and there was humidity in the air. The centaur cantered between the hills, still heading south, and as he crossed a tiny stream he saw a cultivated field. When he tried to get his bearings he came up against a wall. There were several houses on one side. Then a shot rang out. He could feel the horse's body twitch as if it stung by a swarm of bees. People were shouting and another shot was fired. To the left, a splintered branches snapped, but this time no pellets hit him. He stepped back to regain his balance, and with one mighty effort, he leapt over the wall. Man and horse. Centaur. 
went flying over, four legs outstretched or drawn in, two arms raised to the sky, which was still blue in the distance. More shots rang out, and then a crowd of men chasing him through the countryside with loud cries and the barking of dogs. The centaur's body was covered in foam and sweat. He paused for a moment to find the way. The surrounding countryside also became expectant as if it were listening out. Then the first heavy drops of rain began to fall, but the chase went on. The dogs were following an unfamiliar scent, but that of a deadly enemy, a mixture of man and horse. Assassin hooves. The centaur ran faster and went on running until he perceived that the cries had become different and the dogs were barking out of sheer frustration. He looked back. From a fair distance he saw the men standing there and heard their threats, and the dogs which had darted ahead now returned to their masters, but no one advanced. The centaur had lived long enough to know that this was a frontier, a border. Securing their dogs, the men dared not to shoot at him, a single shot was fired, from, the, from so far away that the explosion could not even be heard. He was safe beneath the rain which was pouring down and opening up rapid currents between the stones, safe on this land where he had been born. He continued travelling southwards. The water drenched his white skin, washed away the foam, the blood and sweat, and all the accumulated grime. He was returning much aged, covered in scars, yet immaculate. Suddenly the rain stopped. The next minute all the clouds had been brushed away and the sun shone directly onto the damp soil, its heat sending up clouds of vapour. The centaur walked slowly as if he were treading a powdery snow. He did not know the whereabouts of the sea, but there stood the mountain. He felt strong. He had quenched his thirst with rain raising his mouth to the sky and taking enormous gulps with the torrential downpour running his down his neck and all the way down his torso, making it glisten. And now he was slowly descending the southern slope of the mountain, skirting the great boulders leaning against each other. The man rested his hands on the highest rocks, where he could feel the soft mosses and rough lichens beneath his fingers, or the sheer roughness of the stone. Below, the valley stretched all the way across which, from a distance, seemed deceptively narrow. Along the valley he could see three villages a fair distance away from each other, the biggest of them in the middle where the road beyond headed south. Cutting across the village to the right, he would have to pass close to the village. Cutting across the valley to the right, he would have to cross, pass close to the village. He could pass there safely. He recalled how he had been pursued, the cries, the shots, the men on the other side of the border. That incomprehensible, that incomprehensible hatred. This land was his, but who were these men living here? The centaur, suffering from exhaustion, trod closest, clo cautiously. The horse suffering from exhaustion and the man decided it would be just as well to rest before crossing the valley. And after much thought, he decided to wait until dusk. Meanwhile, he might, must find some safe spot where he might sleep and recover his strength for the long journey ahead before reaching the sea. He continued his descent, getting slower and slower. And just as he was finally about to settle down between two boulders, he saw the black entrance to a cave, high enough to allow him, the man and horse to enter. Using his arms and stepping gingerly with tender hooves on those hard stones, he entered the cave. It was not very deep, but there was enough room inside to move at one's ease. Supporting his forearms against the rocky surface of the wall, the man was able to rest his head. He was breathing deeply, trying to resist rather than to accompany the horse's laboured panting. The sweat was pouring down his face. The horse pulled in front of his hooves and allowed himself to slump to the ground which was covered with sand. Lying down, or slightly raised, was as was his wont. The man could see nothing of the blue valley. The mouth of the cave was only opened up to the blue sky. Somewhere deep inside, water was dripping at long, regular intervals, producing an echo as if from a well. A profound peace filled the cave. 
Stretching one arm behind him, the man passed his hand over the horse's coat. His own skin transformed, or skin which had transformed into him. The horse quivered with pleasure. All of his muscles distended, and sleep took possession of his great body. The man released his hands, allowing him it to slip onto the dry sand. The setting of the sun began to light up the cave. The centaur dreamt neither of Heracles nor of the god seated in a circle, nor were there any more visions of mountains facing the sea, of islands sending up spray, or of that infinite and serenous expanse of water. Nothing but a dull, dark wall, or simply colourless ins and insurmountable. Meanwhile, the sun penetrated to the bottom of the cave, causing all the rock crystals to sparkle, and transforming each drop of water into a crimson pearl that had become detached from the roof after swelling to an incredible size. And then traced a blazing trail three metres long before sinking into a tiny pool already plunged into darkness. The centaur was asleep. The blue sky faded, the space was flooded by the myriad of colours and forge and evening about to fall asleep in its turn. Cast into darkness, the cave had become enormous, and the drops of water fell like round stones onto the rim of a bell. It was already darkest night when the moon appeared. The man woke up. He felt the anguish of not having dreamt. For the first time in a thousand years, he had not dreamt. Had it abandoned him the moment he had once returned to the land of his birth? Why? Some omen? What oracle could tell? The horse, more remote, was still asleep, but stirring restlessly. From time to time he would move his hind legs, as if he were galloping in dreams. Not his, for he had no brain, but only on loan, but stirred by the willpower in its muscles. Resting his hand on a protruding stone, the man raised his trunk, and... As if sleepwalking, the horse followed him effortlessly with flowing movements which seemed weightless. And so the centaur emerged into the night. The moon cast its light over the entire valley, so much light that it could not possibly be coming from that simple little moon on earth. Selene, silent and spectral. But the light of all other moons elevated above an infinite succession of nights where other suns and lands without these or any other names rotate and shine. The centaur took a deep breath through the man's nostrils. The air was soft, as if it were passing through the filter of human skin, and it had the smell of damp soil that was slowly drying out between the labyrinth and brace of roots and securing the world. He descended into the valley by an easy, almost tranquil route, his four equine limbs harmoniously swaying, swinging his two male arms, moving step by step, without disturbing the stone or risking any more cuts on some sharp ridge. And so he finally reached the valley as, as if this journey were part of his dream he had been deprived of whilst asleep. Ahead there was a wide river. On the other bank, slightly more to the left, stood the largest of the village on the southern route. The centaur advanced out into the open, followed by that singular shadow without equal in this world. He cantered through the cultivated fields, choosing beaten paths to avoid trampling the plants. Between the strip of cultivated land and the river, there were scattered trees and signs of cattle. Picking up their scent, the horse became restless, but the centaur went on heading for the river. He cautiously entered the water. The water became deeper until it became up to the man's chest. In the middle of the river, beneath the moonlight, another flowing river. Anyone watching there would have seen a man crossing the fjord, with upraised arms, his ar shoulders and head of a man, and with hair instead of a mane. Concealed in the water, he walked a horse. Roused by the moonlight, fishes swam around him and pecked his legs. The man's entire torso emerged from the water. Then the horse appeared, and the centaur mounted the riverbank. He passed underneath some trees and onto the threshold of the plain, stopped to get his bearings. He remembered how they had pursued him on the other side of the mountain. He recalled the dogs and the shots and the men and their cries, and he felt afraid. He now wished the night were darker and would have preferred to walk under a storm like that of the previous day, which forced the dogs to seek shelter and sent the people scurrying indoors. 
The man thought everyone in those parts must already know of the sentinel's existence, for the news must have surely travelled across the border. He realised he could not cross the countryside in a straight line in broad daylight and slowly began following the river protected by the shade of the trees. Perhaps ahead he might find more favourable terrain where the valley narrowed and ended up compressed between the two high hills. He continued to think about the sea, about the white pillars and the closing his eyes he could see once more the trail left by Zeus when he headed south. Suddenly he heard the lapping of water. He remained still and listened. The noise came back, died away and then returned. On the ground covered with couch grass, the, horse, the horse's steps became so muffled that they could not be heard amidst the manifold murmurings of tepid night and moonlight. The man pushed back the branches and looked towards the river. There was clothing being lying on the riverbank. Someone was bathing. He pushed the branches further back and saw a woman. She emerged from the water completely naked and her white body shone beneath the moonlight. This centaur had seen women many times before, but never like this, in this river, with this beautiful moon. On other occasions he had, been, he had seen swaying breasts and hips, that dark spot in the centre of their body. On other occasions he had seen tresses falling over shoulders and hands tossing them back, such a familiar gesture. But his only contact with the world of women was that which might please the horse, perhaps even the centaur, but not the man. And it was the man who looked and the women retrieved their clothes, and he saw the woman retrieve her clothes. And it was the man who pushed through the branches, trotted up to her as she screamed, lifted her into his arms. This too had been done on several occasions, but there were so few over, there were so few over thousands of years. A futile action, merely frightening, an act which could have resulted in madness, and perhaps did. But this was his land and the first woman he had seen there. The centaur ran alongside the trees, and the man knew that further ahead he would put the women on the ground, he frustrated, she terrified. He would put the woman down on the ground, sorry, he frustrated, she terrified, the woman intact, he only half man. Now a broad plaque came close to the trees, and ahead there was simply a curve in the river. The woman no, was no longer screaming, simply sobbing and trembling, and at that moment they heard the other cries. On the rounding bend, the centaur came to a halt before a small group low of houses concealed the trees. People gathered outside. The man pressed the woman to his chest. He could feel her firm breasts, her pubes at the spot where his human body disappeared and became the horse's pectorals. Some people fled, some others flew, flew themselves forward, whilst others ran in their houses and reappeared carrying rifles. The horse got up on his hind legs and reared into the air. Terrified, the woman let out another scream. Someone fired a shot into the air. The man realised the woman was protecting him. And the centaur headed for the open countryside, avoiding any trees that might impede his movement. And still clutching the woman in his arms, he skirted the house and galloped off across the open fields in the direction of the two hills. He could hear shouting coming from behind him. Perhaps they had decided to pursue him on horseback, but no horse could compete with the centaur, as had been demonstrated in thousands of years of constant flight. The man looked behind. The persecutors were still off some way, some considerable way off. Then, gripping the woman under his arms, he gazed at her whole body stripped naked under the moonlight and said to her in his former tongue, in the language of the forests, of honeycombs, of the white columns, of the sonorous sea, of laughter on the mountains. Don't hate me. He then, he then put her down gently on the ground, but the woman did not escape. From her lips came the words that the man was capable of understanding. You're a centaur. You exist. She placed her hands on his chest. The horse's legs trembled. Then the woman lay down and said, cover me. The man saw her from above, stretched out in the form of a cross. For a moment the horse's shadow covered the woman, nothing more. Then the centaur moved sideways and broke into a gallop. While the man began shouting and clenching his fists at the sky and moon, 
when his pursuers finally reached the woman, he had not stirred. She had not stirred. And whilst they carried her off, wrapped in a blanket, the men carrying her could hear her weep. That night the whole country learned of the centaur's existence. What had first been treated as some rumour from across the border to keep them amused now had reliable witnesses. Amongst them was a woman who was trembling and weeping. Whilst the centaur was crossing this and other and the whilst the centaur was crossing this other mountain, people came from nearby villages and towns with nets and ropes and even with firearms, but only to scare him off. He must be captured alive, he said, they said. The army was also put on alert. They were waiting for daylight before sending up helicopters to search the entire region. The centaur kept under cover, but could hear the dogs barking at frequent intervals, and the, wa and the waning moonlight even caught sight of his men scouring the, moon the mountains. The centaur travelled all night in a southerly direction, and when the sun came up, the centaur was standing on top of a mountain from where he could view the sea. Way in the distance, nothing but the sea, not an island in sight and the wave of a breeze, which smelt of pines, not of the lashing waves or the punja odour of brine. The world appeared to be a wilderness waiting to be populated. It was not a wilderness. Suddenly a shot rang out, and then, forming a wide circle, men emerged from behind the stones, making a great din, yet unable to hide their fear as they advanced with nets and ropes, nooses and staffs. The horses reared into the air, shook its front hooves and swung round in a frenzy to face his enemies. The man tried to retreat. Both of them struggled behind and in front and the horse's hooves slipped on the edge of the steep slope. They scrambled anxiously seeking some support. The man's hands too, but the cumbersome body lost its footing and fell into the abyss 20, me 20 metres below. A jilting edge of a rock inclined, just at the right angle, polished by thousands of years of cold and heat, sun and rain, and hewn by wind and snow, cut through the centaur's body at the very spot which the man, the man's torso became that of the horse. The fall ended there. At long last, the man lay stretched out on his back and looking up at the sky. An ever-deepening sea overhead, a sea with the timely motionless clouds that were islands, an immortal life. The man turned his head from one side to the other, nothing but endless sea, an intermittable sky. And then he looked at his body, it was bleeding, half a man, and he saw the gods approaching. It was time to die. Thank you very much for listening. Um, so I just want to ask you now, um, after having heard that story, um, has there been a time where you felt like you didn't belong somewhere or somewhere that you were born or somewhere that you feel a connection to has been taken from you? That could be a place, it could be, um, it could be a person maybe. Um, and I just want to ask you, what has helped you reclaim that space before? What has helped you move back into that place and make, made you feel comfortable again? Um, it's a bit of a deep question, but um, I hope it's a useful one. Uh, so yeah, again, thank you very much for listening. And if you want to hear more stories in the 100 Stories Deep series, then check out our socials and subscribe to our YouTube channel by using the link below. All right, until next time. Ciao.